Well, welcome to this uh, bite-sized course from Rosen. It's uh, on the topic of natural gas transmission. Some of the learning objectives that we'll have in this course is uh, an understanding of the composition of natural gas and how that affects flow rates. We'll look at relating the physical properties of the gas to its pressure and temperature. We do that through the equation of state. And then we'll take a look at flow regimes and how they impact what's known as the general flow equation, which we use for designing pipe. Uh, we'll look at the sensitivity of some of the variables to flow rate, such as diameter and pressure. And then we'll finish by looking at J-curves and using J-curves to uh, design an efficient pipeline. First of all, let's consider what is a natural gas. Well, it's a hydrocarbon. It's mostly made up of methane, CH4, but we also have in a commingled gas stream from the wellhead uh, other products. We'll have natural gas liquids, ethane, propane, all the way up to pentanes and pentane pluses, which we refer to as condensates. We'll also find in that commingled stream some non-energy containing components, nitrogen, carbon dioxide, and we need to get rid of those. We'll also have to get rid of injurious components like water and sulfur. And so in this next slide, we see the composition of gas, the energy components at the top, and the uh, non-energy components beneath. If we look at categorizing natural gas, though, we'll find that what comes from the wellhead is generally termed raw gas because it's got the impurities within it. And we're going to treat that and convert it to almost pure methane in sales gas. Sales gas has about 98% methane content. It's also referred to as dry gas because the liquids have been removed. However, you've also got categories of gas known as rich or wet gas. It's rich because the calorific value is higher because it's got these other energy containing components like butane and propane and so forth. When we take it out, those liquids take them out, we're left with lean dry gas. Often there can be, for some producing fields, uh, sulfur present or hydrogen sulfide, and that constitutes sour gas. When we've also got the presence of water, we'll get another category called acid gas, and that can be injurious to the internal corrosion of the pipe. We'll find when we are drilling for oil that we'll often we'll find associated gas. It could be on top of the, uh, the gas reservoir, or it could be in solution with the oil itself. Gas pipeline system is made up really of three parts. Upstream, we've got the gathering pipelines that go from the wellhead to a processing plant. And then from the processing plant, uh, we go to a larger diameter, higher pressure pipeline, which conveys the fluid from the processing plant to the city gate, where it then transfers into a network that we refer to as a distribution system. Offshore, uh, gathering lines are sometimes called flow lines. You'll find that being offshore, uh, they don't have the opportunity that we have onshore to locate intermediate compression. So generally, the gathering systems in the offshore are operated at much higher pressure. Let's look at the journey from the wellhead to the burner tip. And that could be either onshore or an offshore producing field. In both cases, they'll generally produce wet gas. And so the journey starts to uh, go from the wellhead to the processing plant where we strip out these liquids and they become uh, part of a fractionating process that will turn them into butane or isobutane, propane and so forth. And they become the feedstocks for the petrochemical industry. That leaves us then with dry or marketable gas, which then goes into the transmission or interstate or interprovincial pipelines. Conventional and dense phase gas, we have to categorize because conventional gas would be a gas that's operated at relatively modest pressures. Uh, when we've got liquid content in the gas stream, we've got to operate at much higher pressures, and we would call that dense phase. And so here you'll find that where you've got the luxury onshore of having a gas plant that can separate out the liquids, it's uh, very common to have two pipelines emerging from the gas plant, one conveying gas and the other the natural gas liquids. Offshore, where the platforms are small, we're going to find that we've got uh, relatively modest room for 
processing and so what goes ashore is usually the product from the well minus any water and sand that's stripped out. So to get that multi-phase product as it's called, we have to operate in a dense phase. Let's look at a phase diagram and what that tells us about the nature of the flow. It tells us that pressure and temperature have a strong effect on how the gas behaves. Does it behave as a gas or a liquid or a mixture of both? The bottom figure here on the left uh, shows a gas pipeline phase diagram in green and a liquid uh, phase diagram in red. They're quite distinct and as I mentioned before, we operate at modest pressures, usually below a thousand pounds per square inch. When we've got multi-phase flow, we have to increase the pressure considerably, and that takes us onto the blue curve, and that would be called a multi-phase diagram, and it contains a mixture of gas and liquids, very common in the offshore, and in North America, we have a representation of that in the Alliance pipeline. The two figures on the right, the topmost one shows for a natural gas how the phase changes from liquid to two phase to gas, depending on the pressure and the temperature. On the left hand side of the curve, on the top right, we've got what's called the, the uh, uh, bubble point, and that's the temperature at which the liquid will boil or start to boil. Uh, at a given pressure. And then on the right hand side, we'll find the dew point curve where the, liquid, the uh, gas will condense and start becoming a liquid. And the point at which uh, the gas can exist as both a vapor and a liquid is called the critical point and it's uh, noted on there at the uh, point C on the curve. And down below we'll see that if the methane content of the gas changes, you can change the shape of the phase diagram quite dramatically. For natural gas pipelines, we're hoping to work right to the extreme right of the uh, diagram on the top right hand uh, of the screen. Ideal gases, you probably know that uh, Boyle's Law, Charles Law and Avogadro's Law were combined. They were empirical laws, but they were combined into a single equation of state by a fellow called Emil Clapeyron way back in 1834. And the behaviour of the gas uh, is well defined for the most part by the uh, ideal gas law. However, we'll find natural gas doesn't really perform that well and uh, we've got to make allowances for that. However, let's just look quickly at the ideal gas law. PV, pressure, volume, is equal to N, the number of uh, moles in the gas, times the universal gas content, times the temperature. And we've got to be very mindful that in all of these uh, calculations that we do, we need to refer to the pressure and the temperature in absolute terms. Natural gas, as I mentioned, deviates from an ideal gas uh, at the common pressures and temperatures that we operate in a pipeline. And so instead of using the ideal law, we have to make a better approximation to the behavior of the fluid. And we do that through an equation of state, the Benedict, Webb, Rubin, Starling, the BWRS, or the Peng Robinson are two quite common uh, equations of state that help us relate the physical properties such as density, viscosity, to the uh, pressure and temperature of the fluid. When we think about how natural gas flows through a pipeline, we have an injection point, and as the fluid moves down the line, we'll find that friction forces, gravitational forces, although they're not often high with a natural gas system, they nevertheless combine to create a pressure drop. And so somewhere between the injection and the withdrawal point, it's common to introduce a compressor. And we're going to find that in natural gas pipeline systems, there are generally two types of compressor, upstream we use reciprocating compression where the compression ratios are high and in a transmission line, uh, they would be more inclined to be centrifugal compressors where the compression ratio is usually between 1.3 and 1.5. Let's look at how fluid does flow in a pipeline in particular. In this diagram, we've got an inclined pipe. We've got a little um, um, a particle of fluid. And on the bottom surface, we've got a pressure P1 and on the top surface, a pressure P2. And the difference in pressure is caused by the difference in the height between those two surfaces. We've got, uh, as a result of those pressures, a force, F1 and F2. We've also got the weight 
of the particle, and that's shown on there as W, and the downward component is F3. These are referred to as gravitational forces. There's a, another type of force that's present there, and it's the, caused by the shearing action of the fluid particle as it moves along the pipe, and that's the force that's shown on there as F4. Um, we'll find that uh, Bernoulli, in co uh, conjunction with Leonard Euler, developed what was called the uh, steady flow energy equation. It's shown here uh, in very simple terms uh, by the equation at the top of the slide. P1, the pressure at the left hand or the uh, inlet to the pipe, over the density, rho, and g, the gravitational constant, plus V1 squared over 2g, where V1's the inlet speed, and then H1 is the elevation of the inlet. And then that equates to, on the right-hand side, P2, the upstream pressure, over rho g, plus the upstream velocity squared over 2g, plus the elevation change. Now, in developing that equation, they made the assumption that the flow is steady between both ends of the pipe, and that the friction losses are negligible. That's not really the case. So we have to add another term there, delta HF, and it's known as the friction loss head, and it's given us by the equation at the bottom right, F times L, the length of the pipe, times the velocity squared, divided by 2G times the diameter of the pipe. So you can see there that the longer the pipe, the greater the, pressure, the friction pressure loss, uh, the faster the flow, the greater the pressure loss, the greater the uh, diameter, the smaller the pressure loss will be. Uh, we can rewrite the Bernoulli equation, as it's called, as the general flow equation. And in that case, we've got what's shown on here. QB is equal to K, a constant, times TB, ZB, and PB. Now let's look at those terms B, or the subscript B, because they refer to a very important parameter, and that's the base condition. All buying and selling of natural gas takes place at base conditions. That would be a temperature of 60 degrees F or 15 degrees centigrade and 14.7 pounds per square inch absolute or 101.35 kilopascal. So irrespective of the uh, individual pressures and temperatures, at any point where we put gas in or take it out, it's all referred back to these datum conditions. And so it's important that we register those and include them in the equation. Now, the other things that are important in that equation are the upstream pressure, P1, and the downstream pressure, P2. And you'll see here that the base flow rate varies with the square of the pressure differences there. And it also varies with the diameter of the pipe to the power of 5 over 2, 2.5. And on the bottom of the uh, denominator, it's a function of the specific gravity of the gas composition, G. The uh, ambient temperature conditions, the flowing temperature in the pipe, TA, the length of the pipe, and another parameter that's very important, and that's Z, the compressibility. And then the uh, probably most important factor, uh, as far as the next few slides are concerned, is what's contained in this bracket, 1 over F, the square root of 1 over F because we call that the transmission factor and it relates the amount of friction that's present in the pipe to the surface roughness of the pipe itself. Now there are variants, there are many, many equations that describe pipe flow and I put some of them here but you'll see that they're very, very similar in layout to the form of the general flow equation. They've got this uh, a term in the middle of the difference in the upstream and downstream pressure squared and diameter uh, to some power and the uh, other conditions are exactly the same. And in the right hand column we find uh, a list of equations that describe uh, values or WES expressions for determining the transmission factor the square root of 1 over F. And we'll find that that's very closely uh, related to the type of flow that we have in the pipe and commonly there are two pipes of flow found in very high pressure pipelines. Uh, the fully turbulent flow condition, we refer to that as rough pipe flow. Partially turbulent flow, which is determined by the smooth pipe law. We rarely have ever run pipelines in laminar flow because the speed would be so low for that condition that it would be uneconomic to run the pipe. The flow regime 
is defined by a non-dimensional parameter called the Reynolds number, uh, developed by a very famous Irishman called Osborne Reynolds. The Reynolds number is rho vd over eta, where rho is the density of the fluid and eta is, or eta is the uh, absolute viscosity. The flow regimes themselves, uh, in pictographic form here, you'll find that for laminar flow, the entire flow is across the, the width of the pipe and we develop a boundary layer. As the turbulent regime is reached, the laminar boundary layer starts to break down and become more turbulent. And so we find these eddies forming in the middle of the pipe and then they move out toward the outer edges. And so uh, we'll find then that in this partially turbulent regime, the middle one there, the uh, laminar sub-layer, while it still exists, we're going to experience viscous losses. And so you'll see that the uh, energy loss is a function of the Reynolds number. Um, when we move into fully turbulent flow, even though the sub-layer is still present, we'll find that it shrinks to a point where uh, it's very, very close to the wall of the pipe, and now the texture or the roughness of the uh, wall becomes important and it starts affecting the flow. That's referred to as the fully turbulent regime. And so we have uh, an important characteristic there where the friction factor is now a function of the cross-sectional area of the flow and the ratio of the pi pipe diameter to the wall roughness. In other words, the friction factor is now a constant with respect to Reynolds number. And for partially turbulent flow, we'll see in this diagram, it's developed as a, a straight line. It's known as the prandtl von Karman equation. And so we can relate the transmission factor, the square root of 1 over f, to the Reynolds number in the pipe by looking at that diagram. More particularly and more commonly, we use a Moody friction diagram, though. And on the right-hand side, we're able to express the relative roughness of the pipe. That's the k, the height of the rough area. Uh, over the diameter of the pipe on the right hand axis and then on the bottom we've got the Reynolds number and there it's expressed as uh, the velocity times the diameter divided by the kinematic viscosity the absolute viscosity divided by the density and then the parameter on the left is the actual friction factor itself and so we'll see that uh, for the most part except when you're very very low flows when you're in the laminar region uh, to the left and we've got a straight line that the friction factor is more curved and uh, we've got to look up that table or when we look at uh, computer models we'll uh, model each of these, we'll curve fit those lines and include them in the software package. Um, as a result of some tests that were done way, way back, you'll find that the Panhandle A and the Panhandle B equations were developed to describe or link, or relate the transmission factor to the Reynolds number. And uh, the Panhandle A, very accurate at relatively low flows, totally inaccurate at higher flows. So the Panhandle B was introduced and that had the reverse effect. It was uh, hopeless at very low flows and pretty good at high flows. And so. We find, though, that there's a point of intersection there uh, that's commonly used uh, to develop other variants of the Panhandle A and Panhandle B. And you'll see below there are several uh, uh, representations there of how we relate transmission factor to uh, the flow or Reynolds number. And in particular, the one that's often used is the AGA fully turbulent. And so it has a little knuckle point, a transition point between partially turbulent and fully turbulent flow. The uh, Panhandle Eastern Company did a whole bunch of tests way back where they put their tests, their, their pipe under test, put dead weights on it, and that's what those dots are, those little points. And so you'll find that they correlate pretty well to the AGA fully turbulent, but in fact we modify them to use an equation that better represents that uh, experimental data, and that's known as the Colebrook-White correlation. And so, uh, again, as I mentioned, we curve fit the Colebrook-White, that's the equation that's shown there, and use that when we're deriving pressure drops as a um, as part of our calculations. And as I mentioned, the Colebrook-White is the most commonly used correlation for dry gas transmission lines. 
Let's look at some of the parametric influences now on gas flow volumes. And that means we've got to think about the effect of pipe diameter, operating pressure, operating temperature, and then the composition of the uh, gas, its viscosity, its specific gravity, and its compressibility. So going back just to refresh your memory of what the general flow equation looks like, we're going to find that here uh, pressure is obviously very important in affecting flow rate because it's varying with the square. It will find that diameter is very, very important because it's varying with the power of 5 over 2. We'll see that gra specific gravity is very important because it's on the denominator and compressibility has an effect, as does the ambient temperature. So we're going to look at those. First, let's look at the flow dependence on diameter. We'll find that for the most part, it's the most sensitive of the parameters. And so if we imagine that the transmission factors uh, could be uh, approximated for consecutive pipe sizes by around about the number 0.98, then Q2 over Q1 for two different pipe diameters, D2 and D1, are represented in that equation. And so let's look at what happens when we take a number of pipe sizes and compare the increase in the diameters, the increases in the corresponding flow rates, and the likely costs of building such pipelines. And this little table sets out for us uh, fairly clearly, I think, that when you increase, for example, uh, a 16-inch line to 20 inches, you've increased the diameter by 25%, but the flow rate goes up by 70%, yet the actual cost of pipeline construction, again, these numbers are, from my experience, maybe not a long time ago when I was involved in design, uh, 26%. And so it's clear there that it's advantageous for you to use a bigger diameter pipe where you can. And that translates all the way through that table, uh, right up to 48 inches over 42 inch pipe. Looking at operating pressure, the analytical relationship that we have between flow and pressure, as we saw with square, a quadratic representation. And so again, we've got to take account of the compressibility factor because it's a function of pressure. Typically for normal gas conditions, operating conditions, Z varies between 0.825 and 0.925, which means the ratio of Z2 to Z1 would be somewhere in the order of 0.9 to 1.1. Generally, the higher the pressure, the lower the compressibility factor. So let's take an example of that. Suppose we wanted to increase the flow in a pipe by uh, operating at a much higher pressure of 9,930 kilopascal instead of 8,275 kilopascal, and yet maintaining the required delivery pressure at the downstream compressor will hold that at 6,000 kPa. So substituting those numbers into the equation, we find that uh, we've got the square of the flows, uh, the ratios of those squares of the flows is 1.928. And then in particular, when we take the square root and subtract one from it, the effect of increasing the pressure by about 25% is a 39% flow increase. Temperature is very important because it affects uh, the flow. It affects the uh, heat being transferred from the ground to the uh, fluid or the fluid to the ground. And so we'll see that it's quite important in terms of its impact on temperature, uh, sorry, on, on uh, compressibility and on viscosity. It's also very important to consider from a compression point of view because the ambient air temperature affects the air density and therefore it, it uh, determines the amount of mass flow that we going, get going into a compressor. You'll find that on a cold day, uh, gas compressors function much more efficiently. And if you think about your own vehicle, once your car has uh, warmed up, it does actually perform better thermodynamically on a cold day than it does in the summer because of the mass flow going through the engine. And so uh, it's very important then that we consider soil temperature, realizing that there is a big difference at the start at the inlet uh, of the pipe between the gas uh, fluid temperature going into the pipe and the surrounding soil. And as the fluid goes down along the pipeline, it starts giving up heat to its surroundings and we see the temperature falling off. And so we need to be aware that um, 
that's happening and in particular when we see a difference of up to 10 degrees centigrade for example in ground temperature it has a, a, an effect on the flow it decreases the flow in fact if you were to calculate it for a 36 inch diameter pipe we'd see a reduction in the deliverability by about 0.75 percent you also have to be sensitive to at uh, the temperature here because if, uh, if we have too warm a temperature it can uh, take the uh, coating off a pipe. Viscosity is very, very important because it uh, is defined as uh, the internal friction in the fluid and it impedes flow. And so uh, we have to be careful about its evaluation. And we'll find that the viscosity of the fluid, the viscosity of gas, uh, varies with its density and pressure until uh, we get to about approximately 10 atmospheres and then after that it becomes very non-linear. Uh, when we consider natural gas properties, specific heat is very important, the specific gravity is quite important and compressibility. We'll find that the heating value, the heat, the heat content of the gas is very important and as we noticed before the phase envelope is important too and they all change with the gas composition. So looking very quickly, if we look at say uh, the, the gas coming out of uh, say related to an oil well, it would be called associated gas and once we clean up that gas and form it into uh, sales gas, you'll see the amount of methane can change from 27% as high as 97%. And so you'll see how these components vary quite a bit. And they have a big impact on the specific gravity, and so we'll see uh, they have an effect on the um, deliverability. So it's important that we understand the correct gas composition uh, when we're trying to do an accurate calculation, not only of the heating value of the gas, but the uh, fluid flow. So here's a, a table or a representation of typical physical properties of a natural gas, uh, CH4. Its molecular weight is about six, 16. Its freezing point or the temperature at which it becomes a liquid is about minus 162 degrees centigrade or minus 296 Fahrenheit. And a specific gravity, typically at the uh, reference standard conditions, about 0.56 and uh, its energy content about 31.6 BTUs per pound or 36 megajoules per meter cubed. When we look at uh, specific gravity we can find the specific gravity of the entire mixture just by doing ratios by following this equation here if we know the specific gravity of the individual components and we look at the uh, uh, molecular weight of that component, we can calculate it as I've done in this table. And so you'll see here that the molecular weight of this combined gas was 22.6. The molecular weight of air at the same conditions of temperature and pressure, 28.96. So the specific gravity for that particular mixture is 0.786. Now in general, the higher the specific gravity, the lower the deliverability, the lower the amount of flow we can get. In fact, the flow rate varies inversely with the specific gravity. And typically, you'll find that uh, for a, a 0.1 change, a 1% change in gas specific gravity, there's approximately about a 0.8% change in flow. And then considering the compressibility factor, we noticed before that a, an ideal gas would have a compressive fa ability factor given us by this equation and we need to modify that uh, for our particular natural gas using the thermodynamic equation such as the benedict webb rubin relationship and uh, we can rewrite or extract from the general flow equation the equation I've shown here that just shows that flow is equal to some constant and then uh, the differences in the upstream and downstream pressure squared uh, and divided by the gas gravity and the compressibility and the temperature. Now most hydraulic simulators, uh, they have the means of a lookup table or a curve fit for compressibility when they're doing their calculation. For pipeline capacity, we'll find that the amount of flow we get clearly is dependent on diameter, operating pressure and temperature. When we want to increase the capacity of a pipeline, there are two ways we can do that. We can uh, loop the pipe, which is what's shown on this little diagram on the top right, or we can add compression. It's usually cheaper to add compression, first of all, before we go to the expense of building a second pipeline. 
And that means that uh, as we get close to the end here, that simple optimization has to take place. We think about our hydraulics, we think about our cost estimate methods, and we find what would be a typical cost of service for different diameters, different operating pressures. Um, and so we try to arrive at an optimum pipe design. A compressor power, the number of compressors that we would have in our system, depends on the pressure drop, and that's a function of the flow rate, as you saw. The compression ratios that are typical in pipelines or uh, transmission pipelines vary between 1.3 and 1.5. You can have them higher, but they're less efficient. When we look at the components that go into the cost of uh, building and operating uh, a gas pipeline, our capital costs and the costs that are related to that, design, acquiring the land and so forth, our operating and maintenance costs, our tax and the return on dep depreciation and return on the rate base are in there. Now, I did these uh, two little calculations for you for a particular type of pipe. It's, uh, the pipe is 67 miles long. It has a, a, an internal diameter of 27.2 inches. And then the topmost uh, calculation will find the flow rate was 270 million cubic feet per day. And at the inlet, we have a pressure of 1,000 pounds uh, gauge. And downstream, we have, again, by the time it gets to the compressor 67 miles away, the pressure has fallen to 793. And so the compressor needs to restore that pressure back to 1,000. It needs a horsepower of 2,700 to, to do that. Uh, it consumes fuel. It's actually natural gas taken from the system that's burnt in, the, in the, uh, the, the engine, the gas turbine that drives the compressor. And we'll find in that particular instance, we're close to the optimum at 1.26 compression ratio. If I increase the flow rate from 270 to, to 310, keeping the upstream pressure at 1,000, you'll see obviously there's more pressure drop and the downstream pressure is now 767 versus 793. So our compression ratio has gone up to 1.3. The amount of power that we require is 3,100. Now we need a bigger unit and we're going to burn more fuel. So we're going to do a range of these calculations to find out how much it's going to cost to build a pipe 67 miles long and 28 inches in diameter, operating it at around 1,000 pounds and adding in the cost of a compressor. And that's exactly what you do with these J curves. You vary the flow rate Pick, pick a diameter, pick uh, an operating pressure, and then start varying the flow rates and do the calculation for the uh, total cost per year for that particular design and divide it by the throughput, and that will give you the annual cost of service. And so these are very simplistic curves, but their shape's very important because we really want, although we could have uh, a very low cost, uh, we do want to have a wide variety, a, a lot of uh, flexibility. So we look for a fairly flat curve. And so in this particular curve, you'd find that arrangement two would be the most effective for us. In order to do all these calculations, we're inclined to use uh, software, and I've numbered some of them here, the Stoner Workstation, TGNet, Simone, and so forth. And so in summary, uh, what have we learned? Well, hopefully we've learned that commingled gas from a natural wellhead needs to be processed. We have to get rid of the injurious uh, products, water, sulfur, and any of the non-energy containing components because there's no point in pipelining them. We get nothing for them. And we hopefully have learned that there are three types of flow regime. Laminar, which is far too slow to be practical for us. Partially turbulent, where the smooth pipe law applies and generally happens when we're building a pipeline from a new developing field before full production has come on. And then generally speaking, we get to the third case here where most pipelines are operated in the fully turbulent mode. And we'll find then that flow rate is highly dependent upon pipe diameter and operating pressure. So thanks for listening. And that's it.